the the event itself is terribly moving one of the crewmen in his uh, in this time of terrible stress and and danger wrote a, a letter i brought the letter with me this is the actual letter, letter. yeah okay. the actual letter the letter is to his wife and his four daughters now he knows he's never going to see them again and what he imagined that he would do would be to put it in a bottle and to throw that bottle into the sea in the hopes that it would be recovered sure. and that they would find it to know how he felt and i was i was terribly touched by that but why don't we look at the story January 19th of 1988 begins as a typical day in the quiet Costa Rican fishing port of Punta Arenas. One of the fishing boats going out that day would be the 29-foot Cairo 3. Joel Gonzalez bids his wife, Edith, and his four daughters goodbye. He's a crewman for Captain Gerardo Obregón, husband and father of three. In addition to Gerardo and Joel, the Cairo 3 carries Juan Bolivar, Pastor Lopez, and Jorge Hernandez. The boat is badly in need of repair, but the fishermen haven't had a decent catch in months. They need the money, so they go. After three days, the men have little to show for their efforts. The weather has become threatening, and they debate whether or not to head back to port. A decision is made to take the risk. They cast their nets once more. In the dead of night, Joel is at the helm when the Cairo 3 is hit by a sudden squall. It is the dreaded north wind called El Norte. Soon, 30-foot waves and hurricane winds pound at the tiny boat. Joel and the others struggle against the brutal beating. The radio is out, the engine dead, and they try to salvage what they can. For three weeks, the men fight the storm, bailing around the clock. The food runs out after three days. They hardly sleep, and all the while, El Norte pushes them farther and farther from home. In Punta Arenas, the wives waited, watched, and hoped. All of the fishing fleet had made it safely back to port, all but the Cairo 3. Edith Gonzalez and Lydia Obregón, the captain's wife, ask the returned fishing crews if they have seen any sign of their men. Several days later, the Coast Guard promises to begin a search for the overdue Cairo 3. Edith and Lydia's hopes are buoyed. The entire town shares the hopes of the women when a search plane returns to the Punta Arenas airstrip. The people press the pilot for news, but he's seen nothing and he will not go back out again. It's too risky, he says. 800 miles from shore, the Cairo 3 is lost and adrift. The crew is alive, but exhausted and desperate. They have begun to argue and bicker, but Gerardo, the captain, makes them see their only hope is to clear their minds and focus on survival. They cannot count on any outside help. They are alone. They establish a precise routine, dividing the labor equally. The boat is leaking badly, so they bail constantly in four-hour shifts. Joel spends most of his time fishing. Jorge kills and cleans. Juan is trusted to cut the catch into five exact, equal pieces, no matter how small. In Ponte Arenas, Joel had absentmindedly tossed a lighter into his suitcase. It is now their only source of fire. The ship's gas tank is turned into a crude hibachi in which they cook their stew of fish and seawater. To have wood for the fire, the men must begin to tear the cabin apart. Every board becomes precious. Meanwhile, sharks almost constantly menace the boat like buzzards. After 70 cruel days at sea, the prevailing winds and current have carried the Cairo 3 1,500 miles into the Pacific. Water runs low, food grows scarce, and the men are in despair. Then on the horizon, there appears a ray of hope. A cruise ship passes close enough for the men to hear the music. They cry out, a flare is fired, but their pleas for help go unanswered.
With the Cairo 3 now gone for more than 80 days, Edith and Lydia begin to wonder if they and their children will ever see their men again. Government and Coast Guard officials have told the women that there is nothing more to be done. Certain that death is near, Hoel finds the only scrap of paper aboard the boat and begins a letter to his wife, Edith. To my beloved wife, I love you and my four daughters so much. God is making things difficult and our strength is ending very quickly. 86 days at sea and the Cairo 3 drifts helplessly more than 2,000 miles from home. In Punta Arenas, Edith Gonzalez refuses to give up hope. She prays each day that her beloved Joel will be delivered safely back. Three months on the open sea takes its toll on the crew. Days pass with no rain, and they are so near starvation that they sometimes can't even wait to cook the few small fish Hoel manages to catch. Spirits are low, and when Pastor accidentally drops the lighter into the oily bilge water, thoughts of death occur to the crew. The lighter is more than their only source of fire. Its flame has become a symbol of hope. Hoel still reaches across the empty sea to his wife. He keeps his letter in a bottle, which he plans to cast into the water during his last moments of life. Edith, he writes, don't spend the rest of your life suffering and wondering what happened to me. Be courageous and try to overcome life's hardships, since from the time of our birth, we know we are going to die sooner or later. And if God takes me first, what can I do? I fought till the end and did everything I could to return to you. But finally, I was defeated. Yet even now, at the brink of death, there is still a little flame in me that refuses to go out. Day 112. The crew of the Cairo 3 has drifted 2,500 miles. Becalmed without food or water, the men talk of suicide. But it is Gerardo, the captain, who shakes them out of it. Once again, he steers their energies toward survival. Jorge builds a gutter and pipe to capture precious raindrops for desperately needed drinking water. The Cairo 3's useless engine is dismantled and cast overboard. With the boat lighter and higher in the water, less bailing will be necessary. Planks are collected to build a makeshift mast, and soon a sail is fashioned. Where it will take them, they do not know. The surge of newfound energy and purpose is short-lived. In 130 days, they have traveled over 3,000 miles, but now hope dies and despair once again sets in. Days pass with no water. The men grow weaker by the hour. Noel stares longingly at the horizon, wishing he could see his wife and children one more time. He writes what will be the final lines in his letter to Edith. We have suffered so much that I believe with death God will finally allow us to rest. I only know one thing, that if it's possible to love after life, I will love you. Day 135. All hope is lost. Each man has saved clean clothes to die in. They wear them now. They have given up. But just as they accept their fate, hope returns once again in the form of rain, fresh water to drink. Again, Hoel and the others go back to their simple routine, fishing, eating, bailing, and hoping. On June 15, 1988, the Cairo 3 has been at sea for 144 days. They are 700 miles from Honolulu, 4,000 miles from home. When Hoel sees something on the horizon, it is the Japanese fishing boat, Kine Maru. This is the actual, real-life videotape taken by a Japanese sailor of the Cairo 3 and her crew as they were discovered and rescued after a record-setting 144-day survival ordeal at sea. Though the Japanese didn't understand Spanish, the moment needed no translation. 
the rescue the men had dreamed of, prayed for, and given up hope of ever happening, was now a reality. Their survival was a miracle at sea. Juan Bolivar, Pastor Lopez, Joel Gonzalez, Gerardo Obregón, and Jorge Hernandez were alive. Soon they would be back in Punta Reyes, together again with wives and children they thought they would never see. The survivors are hailed as heroes. They are the pride of Costa Rica, simple, humble fishermen who would face the ultimate test and won. On the night of his return, Howell reads to Edith what he thought would be his last love letter to his wife. I don't know how much life remains in me, Edith. I pray with all my will to be reunited with you. You and my daughters are everything. I love you without limits. I can't accept reality, but that's the way the end is. I don't regret what I have had in life because it was the best. A great woman, beautiful children, and a wonderful mother. I love you, Edith. I love you. Well, David, thank you for helping us tell that dramatic story. What have you gained from all of this? What have I gained? Gee, I don't know. I think I'm reminded once again that human beings in their last moments, in their moments of, of extremis, look to love as a source of strength. Thank you, David. Very well said. Thank you.